Good morning. Now, the first chapter of Jonah was action-packed, filled with action from the time he received God's command to him running in the opposite direction of where God wanted him to go, to him boarding a ship and the ship getting caught in a huge storm that threatened to tear it apart, to Jonah declaring to the sailors that he was the cause of their predicament and had them throw him overboard into the raging sea where God had prepared this huge fish to swallow him up, saving him from certain death in the sea. 17 verses of fast-paced action that caused many to think that this is the entire story of Jonah. Now, when we talk about Jonah, the first thing that we rem remembered about him is that he was swallowed by this big fish because of his disobedience. Not many people remember that Jonah, the book of Jonah has four chapters. And the fish was only referred to in the last verse of chapter 1 and the first and last verse of chapter 2. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, the last verse of chapter 1 was is the first verse of chapter 2, making chapter 1 16 verses long. And the whole fish story was encapsulated in Chapter 2. Now, although the fish story is miraculous, but it is not the emphasis of the book of Jonah. So we must not overly emphasize this fish story over the Jonah story. Now, at the end of chapter 1, God had prepared this huge fish to save Jonah from drowning in the sea. And on top of that, God had mercifully provided the perfect place for Jonah to contemplate his disobedience. Trapped with nowhere else to go, not being able to get out of this predicament, God had forced him to confront his disobedience and pride, to allow him to repent so that he can make himself right with God. As Brother Raphael had read for us earlier, the second chapter of the book of Jonah recorded his prayer from inside the belly of the fish. So today we will examine this chapter to find out more about prayers, the proper attitude of prayers, and how we can prepare ourselves to pray in times of need. We will also examine the problems that would stop our prayers from being heard by God, and also the promise of God. So when we read verse 1, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. So this is the place that Jonah found himself in after he was thrown overboard by the sailors. If God had not sent this fish to swallow Jonah, that would have been the end of the story. Now when you think about the fish's belly, what kind of imagery do you have? For a long time, I had this mental image of a large cavernous area that is totally dark. This was most likely due to, the, to, the, due to me watching an animated Pinocchio movie when I was a young boy. Now, today's youngsters probably do not even know who Pinocchio is. The story was of Pinocchio's father, Geppetto, who was swallowed by a whale. And Pinocchio was, went to find him ending up also being swallowed by this same whale. They had their tearful reunion in this large cavernous stomach of the whale. Now that's where probably where my mental image of this picture came from. Now, thinking about it, that could not have been a faithful reflection of reality. Firstly, the whale's stomach could not have been so big neither could it be filled with nothing but air. With such a huge cavernous stomach, the whale would likely only be floating on the surface of the sea, not being able to swim very well. Right, the buoyancy of the air in his stomach would make it like a balloon and not allow it, the whale to swim underwater. So the most likely scenario Jonah found himself in would likely be in, the, in a tight space with 
only small pockets of air to breathe. Now, he would likely not be able to move around very much due to this lack of space in the belly of the fish. Probably a space that would only allow him to wiggle about. <laughs> and definitely not a place where he can move around freely. Now, the second part of verse 5 of Jonah's prayer, we read that the death closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Now, there were some scholars who would think that uh, the weeds wrapped about the head of Jonah was an example of typology that refers to the crown of thorns that was put on the head of Jesus as described in John chapter 19, verse 2. I can certainly see where they are coming from, how they came to this conclusion, because Jesus himself referred to the sign of Jonah as a sign of his death and resurrection. But on closer examination, we find that this crown of thorns was given to him by the Roman soldiers. It was used to mock him as the king of the Jews. Not, it was a sign to demean the Lord and not to exalt him. So I find another reading of this weeds to be more appropriate. That is, the weeds around Jonah's head was like a burial napkin, similar to the one that was wrapped around the head of Jesus in his burial. We read about this in John chapter 20, verse 7. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. In our current culture, we picture a napkin as a small square piece of cloth or paper that we use to uh, wipe our mouths or fingers after eating. So you might think about how could this burial napkin be similar to seaweeds wrapping around the head of Jonah? In your minds, you could be imagining just a small square piece of cloth that just barely covers the head. But when we read about the account of Lazarus in John chapter 11, verse 43 to 44, we will realize that our understanding of napkin is not quite what a burial napkin is. And I read, And when he thus had spoken, he refers to Jesus, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, Come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. We read here that Lazarus was buried with his face bound about with a napkin. This napkin was large enough to bind his head such that even when he got up and moved out of the tomb, it was still bound around his head. Moreover, we notice that the hands and feet of Lazarus was likewise bound by his grave clothes. This seems to be the exact image that Jonah found himself in, in the belly of the fish. <laughs> Bound within the tight space of the belly, unable to move much, seaweed wrapped around his head, the exact state of a person prepared for burial. This sign of Jonah, where he spent three days in the position of a buried body, truly typify the buried Jesus, who also spent three days in the tomb in that same position, bound from head to toe. So from this place in the belly of the fish, Jonah prayed. In verse 2, he cried out to God, out of the belly of hell. Now due to the use of the word hell, some might have thought that Jesus, Jonah had thought that he had actually died and was in hell, or that Jonah had truly died. Now, I do not believe either of this to be true 
and we would be better off thinking that Jonah was contemplating his imminent death and crying out to God. Now, there are clues in his prayer that tell us that he knew that he had not died yet. In verse 7, he describes that when his soul fainted within him. Other English translations translated the phrase as, my life was ebbing away from me, or my life was fainting away from me. He was describing himself in the process of dying, succumbing to death. In verse 9, he said, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have bowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, this obviously shows that he knows that he's not dead that, and that there is a possibility that God would save him and he would be able to again sacrifice to God and to fulfill the vows that he had made to God. A dead person would not be able to pray to God, would not be able to fulfill the vows that he had. So the lesson that we must take from this, from here, is that there's only a window of time where we are able to pray to God, which is when we are still alive. Now, there might be some of us here who are waiting for a deathbed confession to repent of all our sins to God. You might be thinking, yeah, you want that eternal life that God promised, that God offers, but you do not want to live in this world by God's rules. So you think that you can live however you want and at the end of your life, confess Christ to gain that eternal life from God since the only requirement that God had was to confess Christ. For those of you who have this thinking, I have news for you. You might not have the fortune of a deathbed confession. Obviously, death can come to anyone suddenly and that takes away that opportunity for a deathbed confession. Now, I'm not cursing anyone here to have sudden death, but that is something that you really need to think about while you contemplate or wait for a deathbed confession. On the other hand, we Christians are waiting for the second coming of Christ. And as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 reads, In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This verse tells us about the suddenness of Christ's second coming. It will be in the twinkling of an eye. There will be no indication of when he is going to come, and when he comes, it happens so fast that you will not have that last opportunity for a confession. Can you imagine that? At that last trump, in the split second, the rapture happens, your Christian friends and family have been brought up, taken up to Christ, and there you are, white eye, mouth gaping with literally nothing to say. Yes, nothing to say. All your pre-prepared prayers of confession amounted to nothing because you can't say it. Fortunately, I have good news for you. The fact that you are hearing this now means that you still have that time for that confession. So don't wait. Don't wait until your time runs out. Moving on to Jonah's confessional prayer, we find that at the beginning of verse 2, he confessed that he was crying out to the Lord by reason of his affliction. This is typically how we pray, how we behave. We only go to God in times of trouble or when we can, could not help ourselves. As we read through the book of Jonah, you will realize that in the four chapters, Jonah prayed to God twice. In chapter one, he was too busy to run, running away from God to pray. Chapter 2, that's our text today. He was praying in affliction. Chapter 3, the topic, uh, the main topic of chapter 3 was not about Jonah. And in the last chapter of Jonah, we read that 
the second time he prayed. And that was the time when he was angry with God. Times of affliction and times of anger were truly the most frequent times that we pray to God. But how many of us, how many of us spend time with God on a relational basis without a list of things that we need from God, without a list of complaints? How many times do we approach God in a prayer like a child coming to his or her mother or father without motive, just wanting to spend time in their company? Now, I'm not saying that Praying to God in times of affliction and anger is wrong. It is truly the best time to do so because in our hearts we know that there's nothing we could do and we had to depend on God. What I'm saying is that these are not the only times that we should be praying to God. We should come to Him periodically as a child to a parent to spend time with Him, to spend to find pleasure in his company. Only then can we truly say that we love God and that we know God. We next come to the way God Jonah prayed in chapter 2. Reading through this prayer, we quickly come to the realization that Jonah was quoting from the Psalms in his prayer. In verse 3, all thy billows and thy ways pass over me was taken from Psalm 42, verse 7. It reads, All thy waves and thy billows were gone over me. In verse 4, I am cast out of thy sight is taken from Psalm 31, 22. I am cut off from before thine eyes. Verse 5, The waters compass me about, even to the soul, is taken from Psalm 90, uh, 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come unto my soul. Verse 7 reads, My soul fainter within me is from Psalm 107, verse 5. Their soul fainter in them. Also in verse 7, My prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. It's taken from Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress, I call upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. The lying vanities in verse 8 was from Psalm 36, uh, 31 verse 6. I have hated them that regard lying vanities. Finally, in verse 9, the phrase salvation is of the Lord is from Psalm 3 verse 8. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Jonah quoted scriptures in his prayer to God. And after reading these verses together, we realized something peculiar about the way he quoted. Yep, they are not exact quotes. They were bits and pieces that he meshed together in his prayer. What does this tell us about Jonah? It seems to me that Jonah was intimately familiar with scripture so that in times of his affliction, he was able to use his knowledge of scripture and put together his prayer. He was not just quoting scriptures verbatim, word for word, or simply regurg regurgitating what he had memorized, but he was using the familiarity that he had with scriptures to put together his prayer. This shows that he was not just knowledgeable about scripture, but that he was intimately familiar with them to the extent that he was able to use them in his time of need. What does this teach us? This teaches us that we need to memorize scriptures like we do in the morning. But being able to memorize scripture word for word uh, is not the essence of it. That's not the point of remembering scripture. We need to be able to understand what we had memorized to be able to internalize the essence of scripture and to be intimately familiar with what scripture says to us. To be able to do this, we must not only memorize scripture's passages, but to do as Psalm 1 verse 2 says, we must 
also meditate upon God's word is laws day and night. Having these words, his words in our minds constantly would allow us to be close to God's words, to be like Jonah, to be intimately familiar with God's words. Another lesson that we can learn from Jonah with regards to scripture is that we need to remember them before we get into afflictions, temptations or trials. Now, we cannot afford to wait until we are in the midst of trouble and then turn to the Bible. You might, not, you might find that you do not know where to find in the Bible the help that you need if you are not already familiar with the scriptures. For those of you who use a paper Bible, thank God. You can still pray and ask God, lead me to where you go and find that place. For those who rely on the Bible on their phones, I'm sorry. I don't think there's a function for you to go to a random page yet. But frankly, if you're not already familiar with the Bible, I suspect the first thing that you turn to in times of trouble would not be the Bible. So from the way Jonah prayed, we find that we learn two things from him. First, we need to be intimately familiar with scripture through memorization, meditation. And secondly, we must do this before the times of affliction, the time where we really, really need to lean on scripture to help us out. We next examine Jonah's prayer to identify what are the problems that he had that caused him to be in this affliction. The first and most obvious issue that he had was his disobedience to God's command. In verse 3, we read about him explaining why he was in the belly of the fish. It reads, For thou hast cast me in the, into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Now we know from chapter 1, verse 15, that it was the, soldier, uh, the sailors who cast Jonah into the deep and not God. Here, Jonah says it was God who had cast him into the deep. And that it was God's billows and waves that was passing over him. What Jonah is doing, he was admitting God's sovereignty. It was God who used the hands of the sailors to cast him into the sea. Jonah knew very well that his main problem was that God was the one afflicting him. He also knew what he had done to draw God's wrath upon him. We know this from the end of verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, which reads, I will pay that that I have vowed. Jonah, as a prophet of God, must have vowed something that is very similar to what Balaam had said in Numbers Chapter 22, verse 18. Balaam said, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Jonah must have vowed something like that to speak only what God had given to him. No more, no less. He knew very well he had not done what God had wanted him to do, which was to speak God's words to the Ninevites. The next problem Jonah had was in verse 4. I am cast out of thy sight. He realized that due to his disobedience to his sin, he was cast out of God's sight. Yet, he also knew that this was not the state that he would continue in, to be left out of God's sight forever. Because he said in the second part of this verse, Yet, I will look again toward thy holy temple. He knew that the condition he was in was God chastening him. Being cast out of the sight of God was God chastening and not a perpetual punishment for him. As long as he knows his error, he repents from it, he was sure that God would bring him into his sight again and that he will again be able to look towards God's holy temple. 
as I was reading the verse, I imagined Jonah crying in anguish. And it also brought to my mind another similar cry of anguish. The one that Jesus cried when he was crucified on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What we see here is an, another illusion of Jesus in the book of Jonah. God, having turning, turned away from Jonah due to his disobedience against God, and God turning away from Jesus because he bore our sins and rebellion on himself. Jonah deserved the anguish that he felt when God turned away from him because he knew that he was deserving of this chastening by God. Jesus, on the other hand, did not deserve any of this anguish. While we sinners live our lives as Christian, free from that ultimate punishment of sins, of our sins, Jesus bore that punishment for us, hanging on the cross, feeling the wrath of God, his Father, who would not look upon him, because of the multitude of sins that he carried on our behalf. When young children did something wrong and their parents turned themselves away to express their disappointment and anger, what do they do? The children will probably go to their parents, tap on their sleeves and say, I'm sorry. Finding comfort in repentance. Can you imagine Jesus doing the same to his father? But Jesus himself cannot even say, I'm sorry. Because he cannot be sorry for not doing the, the wrong that he did. He did not do any wrong. So he can't say, I'm sorry. Jesus could not find comfort from that suffering on the cross. But Jonah, in his suffering, in the belly of the fish, could find comfort by turning to God. Likewise, for us, we can find comfort by turning to God in our times of trials and needs. In verses 5 and 6, Jonah tells of his situation. As I explained earlier, the phrases in verse 5, the dab closed around him and the weeds wrapped around his head, painted a picture of him being buried. In verse 6, he said, he went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with, their, with her bars was about me. This painted a picture of him being brought so low, so low that he was trapped there and that there was nothing he could do to get himself out. The phrase, the bottom of the mountain seems to be strangely out of place here because it did not fit this context of Jonah, who was currently in the middle of the sea. The Lexham English Bible translated the phrase as the foundations of the, temp of the mountains, while the NIV translated it as the roots of the mountains. The word that was translated to bottom in our King James Version seems to have this connotation of foundation or roots, which would make some sense in our context since the roots and foundations of mountains was thought to be as deep as the bottom of the sea. From the Hebrew and uh, Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that had been translated to earth in the second part of this phrase, of this verse, had this special meaning of referring to the underworld, the world of the day. So as, as, if, as Jonah was going down into the bottom of the sea, he envisioned himself descending into the world of the day. And that this world was locked and secured by bars that there is no escape from. That once he enters into, he's trapped forever. In this depressing state, Jonah had a complete turnaround. He declared that God had brought, brought up my life from corruption. 
Now, the word corruption in, in the Hebrew context had also the meaning of pit, trap, or grave, which we find in other English translations. So this closely fits with the context of this verse where Jonah was claiming that God would not let him descend into the land of the dead where he cannot escape and would save him. So strong was this belief that he even declared this in the past tense, as if God had already delivered him from the grave while he was still trapped in the fish's belly. Verse 7 also testified to this. He said that as his soul faints or as his life is ebbing away, his prayer will come to God in his holy temple. And that was his prayer of repentance that God would hear. That was Jonah's prayer of repentance that God would answer and deliver him from death. He cannot save himself, but he is confident that God can and will save him. As a prophet of God, Jonah knows that God would not hear the prayers of those who harbor sins in their lives, in their hearts. The prayers of those who disobeyed God would not be heard. Jonah knew that, and he knew that he was in this current affliction because of his disobedience to God. So how, how could Jonah claim that his prayers were heard by God in verses 2 and 7? And how can he claim that he will be able to look toward God's holy temple in verse 4? How can he be firmly believe that God would save him in verse 7? He knew that God is merciful. That all these things that happened to him were chastisement from a merciful God that if he truly repented, God would hear his prayers. God would forgive him and restore him to his rightful praise as the prophet of God. Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 tells us that Jonah knew that he serves a merciful God. So let us turn to Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 and uh, read that verse together. And he prayed unto God, unto the Lord, and said, I pray thee, O Lord, this not my saying, when I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tashish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. In this prayer to God, after Jonah had completed the task that God had given to him, he saw that God had forgiven the Ninevites and withheld the punishment that he had told Jonah to pronounce unto them. This prayer indicated that Jonah knew how merciful and kind God is and would repent from sending disaster on the Ninevites. From this prayer, we can tell that, God, that Jonah knew God. He knew that God is merciful, kind, and gracious, and that God would forgive anyone who comes to him in repentance. That is why Jonah could make these claims in his prayers in chapter 2. He knew God would forgive him if he truly repents, and he obviously knew that his own repentance was true. Jonah further went on to speak about they that observe lying vanities in verse 8. <clears throat> now, this seems a bit odd because the prayer suddenly went from first person singular, where Jonah was talking about himself using the pronouns me and I, to a third person plural pronoun, where he used the pronoun they. This verse presents various difficulties in our interpretation because in the Hebrew text, it contained only five words. And out of these five words, three of them were translated to they that observe lying vanities or those who cling to worthless idols in the NIV or those who pay regard to vain idols in the ESV. 
Now, due to this change in pronoun, some theologians thought that Jonah was referring to the sailors who had thrown him into the sea and they worship idols. Well, this might make some sense, but in the context of this prayer, while Jonah was in dire straits, would he really be thinking about the sailors or would he be thinking about himself in, in, in that uh, affliction? John Gill, in his commentary, said this, and I quote, Jonah reflects upon himself in particular, as well as leaves as a general instruction to others that should they do as he had done, which is to give way to an evil heart of unbelief and to and attend to the suggestion of a vain mind and consult with flesh and blood and be directed thereby to disregard of God and his will, they will find as he had done to his cause that they forsake the, that God that has been gracious and merciful to them. So what we see here was Jonah reflecting on himself at a time that he was running away from God. The lying vanities or worthless idols that he mentioned would be referring to his own personal idols of pride, biasness, his, his vain mind effectively. His pride tells him that he knows better than God, making him exalt his own biasness against the, uh, against the Ninevites, whom he thinks are not worthy of God's grace and forgiveness. And that made him go against the will of God. Thus, he was the one who had forsaken their own mercy. And due to this disobedience, and honoring his own idols of pride and biasness, he had forsaken God's mercy to him, which was why he ended up in the belly of the fish. This is another lesson that we can learn from Jonah, that we must not prioritize anything before God in our lives. Now, it might not be so obvious as Jonah's pride that manifested into direct disobedience to God. It might be even be something good like our children, our jobs, or even our parents. God must come first in priority before any of this because He demands it of us. When we prioritize others before God, it messes up our relationship with God. If one thing can take the first place of God, that means that another would also take God's second place or third place. And when we start to move God lower and lower in our priorities, it becomes a slow downhill process, a slide that by the time you notice it, God might have already fallen out of our priorities. Having come to the realization that Jonah had his own idols, he referred to his old self in the third person, in an attempt to disassociate himself, to distance himself from that old self, to indicate that he had left his old self behind. Just like what Paul had taught in Ephesians chapter 4, verse, verses 22 to 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye and and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Long before Paul taught this to the Ephesians, Jonah was already an example of a believer putting off his old man and putting on this new man. He put on the new man when he promised God in verse 9, that I will sacrifice unto thee, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that, that which I have vowed. Now, there are those who say that Jonah's prayer of repentance amounted to nothing. Because, because in his prayer, he confessed, he did not confess anything. And that God had to repeat his original commandment, command to God in chapter 3. 
and that Jonah still struggled with obeying God's command to preach to the Ninevites. But having analyzed Jonah's prayer thus far, we really cannot say that his prayer amounted to nothing, right? In his own way, Jonah had repented to God, knowing full well that God would only forgive him if he truly repented of his disobedience. God, who sees the heart of man, saw Jonah's repentance and forgave him by his action in verse 10, telling the fish to throw up Jonah onto dry land. The notion that Jonah's prayer amounted to nothing and yet obtained forgiveness from God is something that we must not entertain because it teaches that God can be lied to. Indeed, we saw Jonah struggle with God's command a second time. But this again teaches us another lesson. It tells us that putting off the old man and putting on the new man is not something that is accomplished by the snap of the finger. This required a sanctification process that is long and painful for us because we would cling on to our whole self. Like Jonah, who wants to disassociate himself from his old self, he still struggles with it. But God's promise was that he will forgive those who come to him in repentance. God did not promise to forgive those who are perfect and sinless, or those who had already cut off their own. So are we in disobedience to God? Are we waiting for God to discipline us, to chastise us before we repent of our disobedience? Do we need to be placed in that deep, dark place in the belly of the fish before we come to the same conclusion as Jonah? So what are we to do now? Don't wait for that dark place before turning to God. Repent, memorize and meditate upon God's word that the words will come to you, come to us in the time of our greatest need to help us in our struggle with our old sinful self so that it enables us to desire to put on the new and righteous man that God wants us to. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this prayer of Jonah. Thank you for allowing us to study his prayer. And Father, we pray that as we um, leave this place, help us to meditate upon your word. Help us to learn of true repentance. Pray that God, you will help us to develop a true and loving relationship with you instead of only coming to you with prayers and com complaints. Father, we pray that you be with us and help us to keep this law stay holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.